like if you're going to ask to see Batman's gloves, it's when he's invited you over to the Batcave. That's the thing. I'm like, this is the time. The time is now. If not now, when? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Welcome to Bat Lessons, the Batman History Podcast. I'm Alex. And I'm Brian. And on this episode, we have a first appearance double feature. We're talking about the malevolent Mad Hatter and crack photographer Vicky Vale. And to help us chat all things Batman new and old, history to anecdotes, truly wherever our whims take us, we have a very special guest, Sasha from Cashley Comics. Welcome to the show. Hi, I'm really glad to be here. I'm excited to talk Golden Age Batman. Yeah, uh, you, you helped us choose out this topic, this this comic issue. Are you excited to talk about Vicky Vale and, and Mad Hatter? Absolutely. I'm always excited to go this far back because you don't always get the opportunity to go there. And then to see the evolution of how the characters have gone from where they started is always really exciting. Yeah, that's what we're all about. Yeah, totally. Uh, are these some of your favorite characters or do you have any other uh, favorite story featuring either of them? They're not necessarily my favorite, but what I really like is charting the evolution of Vicky Vale, especially because she ends up being one of the characters who vanishes during Julia Schwartz's whole, we're getting rid of characters who are too silly. Mm -hmm. So it's just fascinating to see her go from there, disappear, and then come back and all the kerfuffle that happened there with like missing details and stuff. Totally. Yeah, totally. Um, for us, like we we are learning all about this for the first time. Like the premise of the show is not that we're experts, <laughs> right? It's that we're we're kind of like discovering this history for the first time. So I got to be honest with you, like Vicky Vale, I n know her from the '89 movie and nothing else because like she's not around for the most part in, in modern comics. Like little cameos mm -hmm. here and there, but um, and so it's been interesting to 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 learn about it. And I, I, hopefully we can take our our uh, audience uh, with us on that journey today. Yeah, totally. I uh, one one thing that I think is kind of fun as well is I've I've been playing uh, the Arkham Knight game, oh, which yeah. is like I know it came out like ten years ago. That's how far behind I am on video <laughs> games. It's totally fine with me. But like one of the like Riddler uh, quests is to like it's a Vicky Vale reference, and there's this big Vicky Vale uh, billboard. And mm -mm. Uh, I remember the first time I saw it when I was just like playing the game. It's like oh I know who that is because of the '89 movie. Um, right, right, and, right. Uh, so it's it's fun to see like that all kind of coming back around totally so um batman number 49 is the first appearance of both these characters it's october 1948 um and for us on bat lessons this is zooming way forward so the last thing we spoke about was the first appearance of two-face this is six years after that um yeah. and there's gonna be stuff that are firsts for us on bat lessons but are not firsts for batman <laughs> so we're not gonna talk about them because we'll probably talk about them in future episodes but it's like uh, Bat Signal is going to be a first for us. Bat Cave, mm -hmm. Alfred. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll we'll loop back on a future episode to talk more about those things. Something else to note, if you want to follow along uh, uh, with the issue, this is not on DC Universe Infinite for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so it's harder to come by. I actually, <laughs> uh, I don't know how I'm going to edit into the show, but like I took photos of my copy of the paper omnibus. Uh, so uh, maybe that'll get edited in the episode. I don't know. It is a bit hard to find. The version yeah. I have is from the digital. I have it up actually right now. It's the oh. Batman 75th anniversary. Okay. So that's still available to get like direct digital download. So it's still okay. there. But like the other one it was reprinted in was Batman in the 40s. And that one's a bit uh -huh. harder to get nowadays. You can still get the 50s, but the 40s is harder. So gotcha. That's good to know. Yeah, because like uh, if I didn't have the paper copy, I don't know what we would have done. So another thing to note is that the art in this is uh, at least we think the art in this is by Lou Schwartz, who was the the primary Batman artist from 1948 mm -hmm. to 1953. There's some people who say this might be Jim Moody. Um, I can't I can't find anything definitive on that. But just uh, put a pin on on Lou Schwartz. I'm sure we'll come back to him because he was a, a, a primary artist during this time and like has a fascinating story of his own. So yeah, with that, do you do you want to uh, take a look at this comic together? Yes, there she is. <laughs> There she is. So yeah, the the title page, um, we jump right in. We've got Vicky Vale front and center. It very clearly she is is the driving force in this issue. And like right off the bat, we get like nineteen forties, you know, gender dynamics that are really interesting. Like they, they call her girl photographer, which I think mm -hmm. is an interesting mm -hmm. title, but then also are, you know, uh, heaping praise upon her. Say she'll climb the highest mountain. Um, swim the deepest seas just to get the picture. And she's there with in a dark room with a, a photo of Batman next to uh, someone out of costume, po possibly Bruce Wayne. No, it's a good title scroll, especially because the this is the second 
issue, like the second story in the original issue that it's from, it follows a story mm, called mm. The Prison Doctor. And yeah. so going from that one to this one, it's certainly a bit of a contrast. But it's fun, too, because I always autofill in my mind girl reporter because I always mm-hmm. automatically go to Superman. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, we're not talking right. about Superman. This yeah. is the Batman version. Vicki Vale, she's a photographer. Mm-hmm. There's a big yeah. difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely distinct character. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, uh, we, we cut to the story we're in a yacht club. There's Bruce and he's in his, you know, sport jacket and his, you know, V-neck sweater. His sailor cap is on. And Alfred says, there's a photographer here to see you. And he says, ah, let him in. And Alfred's like, beg your pardon, but it's a her. And I, I love Vicky here is like sticking up for herself. She's like, don't be surprised. You know, is um, this Alfred? Yeah, that's um, original Alfred. Yes. No <laughs> so, way. Yeah. So I we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Got this it. is um this is Alfred Beagle, although they give him the last name way later. But this is his original look, and then they end up changing it because the popularity of the TV serials, well, the theater serials. I always do that. And people it. are like, people weren't at TV. I'm like, I know it's the theater. I just auto mm. like I automatically say TV, but that actor they ended up modifying the appearance to match that there's a whole story huh. where they go into like oh he went to he went to a fitness club and now he's taller and has a mustache and it's just different <laughs> oh that's super that. funny <laughs> yeah we're, we're we have i'm working on show notes right now for an episode both on the newspaper strips and and the serials and those are mm-hmm. like coupled and and there's like d- debate about like who originally had the idea or what format alfred yeah. was picked up for yeah um but yeah this is what he used to look like and um crazy yeah she says that she wants to get a picture of bruce next to a trophy i assume that he won and he's like asking her on dates and she's shutting him down which uh i I love that uh showing some agency off the bat and bad hatter shows up it's uh (laughs) like right away like this this just like doesn't waste any time at all it's like hey this is vicky vale hey can i get a picture with this 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 like trophy of, of value and then like this dude shows up mad hatter and is like i want to steal that trophy now please like it just moves <laughs> yes and they don't explain they don't bother explaining anything about mad hatter either like it's just he's he's here it's a dude in a purple you know mm-hmm. suit with a red bow tie and a ridiculous hat well he's very close like he's close to the carol illustrations mm, like he, he does Absolutely. look like the book version at least here yeah. at the start Yes. And it does make a nod to Alice in Wonderland. It says uh, it, this character as if uh, stepped out of an Alice in Wonderland illustration. So it is hitting it right on the right on the head. We know exactly where this Mad Hatter uh, was uh, devised from, I guess, derived. Totally. So yeah, Mad Hatter it, wastes no time and he's sticking everyone up. He's got his goons, they've got guns, and they're like stealing stuff. They're, they're taking the gold trophy. So then Bruce Wayne is in a little bit of a predicament because he's like, oh, I got to go after this guy, but I can't let this photographer know that I'm Batman. So he just kind of like sneaks out and goes after him. Right. In the caption, they say that they're all escaping on the boats, which I think is really interesting that like they're trying to get away from that hatter. They're, they're going to the boats for some reason at the yacht club instead yeah. of like, out the front door. But also like sailboats. I would not yes. think of that as like a fast way to get away. Right. Or as a yacht. I guess these are 1930s oh, yeah, yachts or 1940s but, but yachts. But they're powered by sail. Yes, they are. Yeah, Batman commandeers a, a, a yacht and th- they're fighting goons on the high seas. It's kind of a fun little action sequence. And mm-hmm. what's fun is you already see Vicky in action. And this is very yes. much a hallmark of the woman of the Golden Age because there's a huge difference in between Golden Age and Silver Age in terms of depictions because of what happens mm-hmm. with the code and the norms that have to be enforced. And so you see just a very different type of relationship. And even at the start here, like he's not that worried. He's kind of looking to show off, which is fun. He's like, she's going to get a picture. She didn't count. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. Very much like later on in the issue, she'll be an active participant in the action as well. And Mad Hatter whips a a gun out. I I don't know if it's implied that he he took the gun out of his hat. I think so. I think he keeps things under his hat. (laughs) Yeah. Just the 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 motion, uh, whatever you call the motion line. It was like he pulled it out of his hat and yeah. quick drew is his little gas gun. He's shooting at, Bat- at Batman. Yes. And he's like knocked out into the sea and, and who saves him? But, but Vicky Vale. Well, one important note here, because this is part of the plot, is he throws mm-hmm. the gun at him and he cuts Batman's chin. And I, so yes. when Vicky Vale pulls him out, she's like, oh, this cut on your chin. We need to take <laughs> care of it. And, and then we can we can move along. Totally. We see Vicky Vale showing her photo of uh, Batman fighting the goons on on the boats to her editor. And he's Mm -hmm. like, get me more 
pictures of this. And I, you know, I'm not as familiar with the, the Lois Lane, you know, Superman dynamic, but this reminds me of like Peter Parker, J Jonah Jameson, for sure. He's like, your assignment is, is Batman now. All the pictures of Batman. <laughs> Get yes. me pictures mm-hmm. of Batman. <laughs> mm-hmm. And wh- how she decides to go about that, I think is hilarious. This, this was like, also something that's kind of new to us is, is the sort of like duly deputized officer of the law angle where she goes to Gordon and is like, Hey, I know that, that you're like buddy, buddy with Batman. Can you get me, you know, connected with him so I can take photos? And he's like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I just got this clue from the Mad Hatter. He sent us a hat and I was going to call him anyway. So let me turn on the bat signal and he'll come. And so they do. And she's like snapping pictures of the bat signal. And then she's basically having this conversation with Batman. And the way that she convinces him to like let her shadow him is if I can get your story out there and like get photos of you like beating up criminals in the paper, then maybe they will turn away from their life of crime. And he's like, sounds like a good plan to me. (laughs) Well, this is what's a really fascinating moment is because it's a flip on a dynamic that you're going to see later on in that the idea is the Mad Hatter has been inspired by the other villains because they make a big deal about, look, he's leaving a hat, like a calling card, like the other villains do. Ah, So in a lot of later stories, they talk about the idea of like, does Batman create the criminals that he fights and all of that stuff? But this is looking at from the other side of are all these villains inspiring other villains to like come Mm -hmm. out and try the same thing. And if we publish photos of Batman, will it stop? The answer is no, but it's a good plan. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not e- not even a decade into Batman stories at this point, and they're already they have like a slight deconstructive angle of like what's the cycle here. Yeah, I, I didn't catch that. That, that. That's good. So Vicky Vale and and Batman are talking about this hat, and Batman doesn't know what it is. And Vicky Vale is like, "Well, if you were a woman, you would know that type of derby is worn by women horse riders." And then she's like, "You know what?" I know just who to call to have the in on on this derby. I'm going to call Bruce Wayne because he was he really had the hots for me the other day. And I'm going to take advantage of that date he offered. And Batman's like, oh, great, great idea. Totally. Let's let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and Batman zips home as fast as he can. Races home, which, yeah. Yeah. Which she must have been slow on the, the call because like I can't imagine how long that took him to get back to the mansion. And he runs inside as the, the phone ringing. is ringing yeah. and he answers it just in time and accepts. And, and then they go go to this derby. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, 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 it's interesting to me that she, she chooses Bruce as her in there. I don't know if it's like the fact that he's like a socialite, you know, social butterfly named Bruce Wayne is what she calls him. So like, Mm -hmm. um, that's her angle and yeah, they're watching the show and who shows up on a horse, but the Mad Hatter. Which I love for a couple of reasons, because he's about the right height to be like a jockey for a, like a horse like this. So I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, if it weren't for the ridiculous hat, he could probably. <laughs> yeah, blend yeah, it. that's right. Another interesting element here is that this is the first time Vicky Vale is seeing ba- uh, Bruce Wayne after the Yacht Club incident. Mm-hmm. And she's asking, mm-hmm. oh, where'd you get that cut on your chin? Yeah, the cut that he that. got as Batman. Um, and so this is where she's starting to connect the dots and put that puzzle together on, on like, maybe these are the same dude. Yeah. And I love that, um, as the Hatter's showing up, she jumps into action. So she she's vaults like, the fat. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. She's like, I'm getting the photo. I'm going in there and we get an action sequence. It's, uh, you know, Robin's kicking standard dudes in the butt. Yeah. And, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Batman jumps through a ring of fire <laughs> on a steed on a horse. And, yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's uh, quite the shot. Yeah, you definitely get the sense like uh, Hatter's knocked off his horse. They they're outnumbered, or um, Batman's going to take him down. So they they're like, we got to get out of here. So he uses again a trick out of his hat. There's like a gas mm-hmm. cloud. I don't know if that's cover so they don't see where he's going. I don't know if that's like causing people to cough. Whatever the reason, the cough is is what they need, or the the fog, the gas is what they need to get out of here. All of his stuff out of his hat is gas related so far. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. He's, he's the master of hats and gas. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we, we see uh, Vicky in her apartment later, and she's like, every time Bruce disappears, um, Batman shows up. And she gets the idea that she's going to somehow develop photos on top of each other. So she takes a photo of Bruce and a photo of Batman and overlays them and says, like, yeah, the face looks the same. Like, the, the, the mouth features. This could be the same person. And so she starts hatching a scheme for how she's going to prove that they're the same person. I think this is really funny, is that somehow in the future, they've invited 
her to come see <laughs> the Batcave. They sh- they get they meet at police headquarters. They blindfold her. They take her to the Batcave, and they're like, "Come take photos of all our stuff." <laughs> She asks to see Bruce's glove. I, I assume because she's curious. What does she say? Well, at the at the very top, she had said uh, to carry out a plan because this cut thing is like really interesting. So let's mm. see if I can devise a way to like prove that they are the same person. So she takes this special uh, powder with her that that fluoresces. Yes, um, and so. Uh, she uh, she says in a very like clumsy like clu- kludgy way like I've I've always wanted to try on one of right. Batman's gloves. It's Could I yes. now, please? And he's like, uh, yeah, that's strange, but like, yeah, whatever. It's, go go nuts, you know. And he gives her the glove and she puts it on and she's like, oh, this is so wonderful. And then she hands it back like they're kind of moving along. And right. inside, you can tell she's like, ha ha, I've, I've got right. him. And so now, <laughs> now she's going to set up time to go see, see Bruce Wayne after this and see if his hand glows. I just love that he says, you women think of the craziest times to do things. Oh and whenever I gosh. read that, I'm always like, but when, when, when would be the time? <sighs> like, what would be the time to ask to wear his gloves? <laughs> I feel like if you're going to ask to see Batman's gloves, it's when he's invited you over to the Batcave. That's the thing. I'm like, this is the time. The time is now. If not now, when? <laughs> exactly. Batman slips away. He's going to investigate this hat and and she's going to photograph their trophy room. I love that they have a trophy room. And he finds that there was a trace of hay on the hat. And somehow that's the clue of, of where Mad Hatter's hideout is, which happens to be um, a theater where there's a stage production of Alice in Wonderland. I don't know how hay, how hay connects them to that, but... You can see in the background that there is hay way off to oh, the left. So it's sure. like a stage production in a barn or something. Or maybe at that time, hay was a common thing in theaters. I, I couldn't tell you, but yeah. There's definitely no farms or zoos anywhere, you know? <laughs> yeah, world's greatest detective. <laughs> <laughs> and this is kind of an excuse for the, 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 the Bill Finger set piece of like, we're just getting all kinds of, like they've got gigantic paintings, um, you mm. know? And um, they reference the book a bunch through mm-hmm. the looking glass, Cheshire Cat uh, off with his head. And I love that that Vicky is the one to intervene here. She's kind of uh, the, the catalyst to be able to uh, have Batman uh, save the day. They're like um, teaming up on this one. She says she's going to snap a picture of him and this distracts Mad Hatter so he can come in and give the knockout blow. I love how confused he is. <laughs> <laughs> you want my picture? Like, what's, what's going on? I don't, I don't think you understand what's happening here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like, they, they're trying to do some stuff with punctuation, but like, I kind of imagine going like, my picture? <laughs> like, just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, they they catch Mad Hatter and we're, we're done with that. We're, we're wrapped up. Mm-hmm. Vicky and Bruce Wayne are having a date later and he comes in with flowers. He's handing them to her and she turns off the lights to see if his hands glow. And uh, indeed they do. Uh, not just one, but both of them. And she's kind of confused about that. She's like, why Why both? And Bruce is like, oh, you know, it's the novelty flowers I bought you. <laughs> they just happen to be luminous. I must have touched them. And so that's how my hands are glowing. You can see she's really disappointed that, like, this is, she wasn't able to catch Batman as Bruce. Like, she's been foiled somehow. I So I, I recently read this, like, list of, like, terrible idioms or, or metaphors or whatever that. Uh, high schoolers came up with in their writing and I immediately thought of that here because uh, Vicky Vale is like oh I was just thinking that sometimes the brightest idea is as bright as a burned out bulb <laughs> like that's just like kind of a bad bad comparison but like <laughs> it, it makes the point yeah specifically a flash bulb which would be like the the flash of a, of a oh of a, a photographer yeah yes 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 that is clumsy and so then then after that Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson are are chilling and and Dick is like how how did you know what did you do and Batman's like oh well of course when I was in my lab I turned the lights off and I noticed one of my hands was glowing <laughs> I thought that was strange so I uh, I figured out what she must have done and I made sure to get glowing flowers that would take her off the scent which like it's kind of weird to me cuz I would be like oh I'll just wash my wash hands wash my hands <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And he also just knows, like, oh, yeah, the glowing flower shop where they have the, the glowing flowers. <laughs> yeah. 
it made me concerned because given the air, I'm like, is this radium? Like, are they right. radium? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. That's no, a that's good point. Thing. It's like, it's not, it can't be UV reactive, right? Because it happens when it's dark. So it has to be radioactive. It's like uranium glass <laughs> shards all over everything. Dust. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. You're like 100% right. Yeah. So yeah, and then, then we get a little final panel where they're thinking about each other. He says, now that I fooled her. I can see oh. her again. <laughs> exactly. And she's like, I think he duped me. Like, I, I think that, that I was tricked here. And that's the start of the, the Bruce Wayne, Vicky Vale, uh, cat and mouse. Yeah, before we before we cut to history, what do you guys think of the story? I like this one. I, I like this one a lot. I think it's interesting from a historical standpoint. I think it's a fairly solid story on its own. It's not doing anything revolutionary, but it's yeah. fun. And it introduces some characters who end up becoming important. So it does have that retroactive kind of, ooh, like this is where they all began standpoint if you're reading it from now. But I do like how Vicky is depicted. I like the different relationship they're setting up for her with Bruce compared to what he's going to have going on with Catwoman or what he had going on before this with Julie Madison who dumped him because he played the playboy too hard. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we haven't gotten there yet, but um, it's it's. The, I always thought that the the Julie uh, Madison dynamic was a little awkward, or at least it is in the stuff we've read so far, because she's there and then she's not, and um, their relationship is v- yeah. very superficial for sure. <laughs> um, I, I I like that Vicky has a has a real character. She's got Moxie, and mm-hmm. um, oh, definitely, yeah. This is a a good a good first outing for sure, and I I think you know. In the Golden Age, it's very hit or miss, or at least it has been in the, in the comics we re- reread so far. But like, this is paced very well. It's a mm-hmm. it's a tight twelve pages. Yeah, it, totally it agree. Goes. For Mad Hatter, this is the only appearance that the character has uh, in the Golden Age. Uh, so th- that's something we've been keeping track of. Is like, mm-hmm. okay, how many times did Joker appear? How many times did Catwoman appear? But it is worth noting that like this is towards much closer to the end of the Golden Age. So he mm-hmm. shows up again in 1956 which is only eight years later, Mm -hmm. Um, but not again during, during the golden age. And yeah, like you pointed out, it's uh, very much uh, a copy of the Sir Sir John Tenniel art from the Alice in Wonderland book. It's the original art. So yeah, like Mm -hmm. adapting and and reimagining characters in this way um, from the public domain is pretty common in comics. The one that most people Mm -hmm. probably know is Thor. Fables is another recent example of this. Frankenstein is a recurring character in DC. Um, but here in the the later part of the Golden Age, there's like a rash of them, especially for Batman. Uh, Mad Hatter is one that we get Tweedledee and Tweedledum later, mm-hmm. Solomon Grundy, which I think is really interesting. That's kind of like a Bill Finger thing where he's like just taking characters entirely, picking them up and putting them in his stories as opposed to like simply being inspirations. Everything we've talked about up until now has been like, what are they inspired by? And this is more of like, yeah, just a copy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, we we've kind of bandied about this idea of having um what do we call it plagiarism corner or or something yes Um, (laughs) where we're always talking about plagiarism in these early early um issues uh but it's like they finally got smart and we're like well if we just take open source or yeah uh, yeah. public domain (laughs) yeah public domain stuff then it is it's not plagiarism (laughs) there you go yeah the original book i thought this was interesting alice's adventures in wonderland comes out in 1865 which is about 83 years before 1948 when this issue of Batman is written. And in turn, 1948 is about 76 years ago now. So not dissimilar amount of time. Like they're calling back to something that is old, but classic and like reimagined and readapted many, many times, just like we right now are talking about Batman. So, you know, on our show, we've, we keep coming back to 19th century English literature, Mm -hmm. the Victorian fiction on the show. It's just like just as pertinent to Bill Finger as Batman is to us now. So I, I just thought that was a really interesting sort of parallel. Cause mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I, I feel the need to like justify it. Cause we've done um, Spring Hill Jack. We've done Jack the Ripper. We've done mm-hmm. all this Victorian stuff uh, feeling the need to like justify to our audience. Like, why are we talking about like 19th century <laughs> literature or whatever? Again, yeah. <laughs> well, it's like those influences, they're very, very strong. And what mm-hmm. I find fascinating about this is what they don't take, which mm. is they don't really take the mad part of the yeah. Mad Hatter. Like he's quite, you know, sane and competent and working his way through stuff, which is very different from what you would expect of the the whole Hatter, which is coming, of course, from the fact that Hatters tended to be mad because of all the mer- mercury they inhaled making the hats, mm-hmm. unfortunately. So, <laughs> yes, yes. So the March Hare 
that was a turn of phrase in in um at the time which was mad as a march hare mm-hmm. and then mad as a hatter also turned the phrase and and carol is clearly understanding that phrase to yeah be about the hat makers who because they were working with felt and mm-hmm. uh part of the creation of that was was mercury like yeah would would give them poisoning and, yeah. and make make them nuts but yeah they don't they don't do that you're right it's really just kind of like they took the art you know and made them look like that they basically um, take the hat theme they're like we because gimmicks and villains who leave calling cards is very much on vogue. So they're like we need villains who leave clues and things, and it's really interesting how many of them end up becoming a big deal later on. <laughs> I would argue that even though he comes back in 1956, seeing him on the 66 TV yeah. series does really help jolt <laughs> him even further into the lexicon of Batman villains who end up sticking around. A lot of people end up getting revitalized by that show. Like the Riddler's another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. It's it's where probably I know the character from the most is the 66 show where he has kind of like gadgets inside of his hat. Um, he's like mind controlling people and stuff. <laughs> so th- this might be kind of a strange parallel, but yeah. but since like it's the Mad Hatter, he's got his big hat and yeah. everything he used was some sort of gas related thing. My mind, this is pretty obscure, but my mind goes to the, the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. What is that? Uh, he, uh, it's this, this uh, well... It, it is debatable. Some people think it was like a a mass hysteria, and some people think like there was someone who was uh, gassing people with like essentially anesthesia um, in the mid forties, like nineteen forty four. Um, this is the thing that actually happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, That's the wild. thing that actually happened. Yeah, um, it's and which would be right around the time for them to use as huh. inspiration for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about four years later that this this issue came out. Okay, yeah, that's fascinating. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Mad Gasser of Mattoon. So Vicky Vale, uh, uh, unlike Mad Hatter, appears in the Golden Age 21 times. So they waste no time. Like, um, she's back often, right? Because there's only, like, you know, eight years or six years left in what most people consider the Golden Age, right? So very popular character. And I, I'm sure you know more about it than us, Sasha. I don't know if you can speak to, like, her prevalence and frequency. No, it's just like she has that dynamic that was very popular at the time of the female sidekick. Sidekick's not quite the right word. Some of them had sure. sidekicks. She's more the the foil who's trying to catch you out and quasi love mm. interest. So that was just a mm-hmm. very popular format. And it was working for the two of them. The only problem is that the general popularity of superhero comics overall was waning. And so a lot of those tropes just weren't landing the exact same way they used to. So the gap doesn't end up being surprising when they have to restructure things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I looked into it a little bit, and like the the you're, you know I don't have as much um, context with the comics, but it, it does seem that it, like her archetype is very much a trope, not just in, in comics but uh, across fiction at the time generally. Which is like Margot Lane in the Shadow is someone else who it fits this trope, and then Lois Lane as well. Which is you know Lois was inspired by a set of movies. Um, that Warner Brothers was putting out at this time about a character named Torchy Blaine, Mm -hmm. who's a a female reporter, lead character. And in this period in pop culture, it seems like being involved with newspapers as a reporter or photographer is like one of the few ways that female characters are being able to be portrayed as like smart and competent and capable and like in the action. And um, they've definitely like, like this is the lowest lane counterpart in in mm-hmm. Batman where they're they're sort of taking that and and running with it. Mhm. But just in general that was the way for a lot of them like um uh the I'm trying to remember right now even though the book's right behind me I'm like who am I thinking of right now the Sandman. Like oh, yeah. his like his female counterpart like even though she's an heiress she does very much the same thing. Like the women are just very active during this time period and they're all even though across the books you'll find similar tropes, inside of the books you'll find that there are different ones. Like if you look at the type of woman in Golden Age Batman, like Julie's different from Vicky, who's different from Selina, unless she's not named, but we're going to call her that anyway. So sure. it's fine. We're going to call her that for now <laughs> until she gets named eventually. Yeah. Um, w- one of the things that we've been able to do with the characters up until now is provide quotes from all of the people who were in the room. Um, so mm-hmm. like with Penguin and um, Two-Face and Joker, you have like Bill Finger and mm-hmm. Bob Kane and Jerry Robinson on the record. And unfortunately with some of these characters that came later, we don't have that context. Like, so I looked for Mad Hatter. I couldn't find anything from, from Lou Schwartz or, or from Bill Finger, which makes sense. Like Bill Finger, we only have a few interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, Vicki Vale, because she appeared in the 
1989 Batman movie. Bob Kane was doing press for the movie at the time. So we do have a quote from him. Mm -hmm. Um, I I will caveat that this is probably not true. (laughs) We'll talk about it in a minute, but he's a commonality among (laughs) many of our, our voice uh, clips that we get here and there is that we always, it seems like we're always saying like, this is probably not true, but this is what they said. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And, and as we know from the Bob Kane quotes on, on uh, Catwoman, he's like, a raging misogynist. So like the things he says <laughs> yes. here are wild. The stuff that comes out of his mouth. He says in 1948, I came to Hollywood uh, when they were doing the second Batman serial. I went to a party after the serial was shot and met a beautiful blonde actress named Norma Jean. I talked with her and asked her to dance, but the music isn't playing. She said, that's okay. I replied that way. I get a chance to hold you. We were just kidding around. She has this whippy, w- had this wispy voice and we danced together when the music played and I asked her for a date, but she said that she was married. She was only 17 or 18 years old. She had oh this lost, <laughs> little girl <laughs> lost quality. I knew she would make it as an actress. I didn't see her again until 1958 when I came to Hollywood again and she was on the Columbia lot. She was then called Marilyn Monroe and <laughs> had become quite famous. She remembered, by the way, this is Tom Andre has asked her, <laughs> how did you come up with Vicki Vale? And he's just telling a story about how like, he flirted with Marilyn Monroe. I know. He's like, I need to name drop Marilyn <laughs> yeah, Monroe. Yes. yes. <laughs> this keeps going for like another paragraph. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to skip it. But then he says, after I met Marilyn, I used her image to draw Vicki Vale, girl photographer. I did some sketches of Marilyn in Santa Monica in 1948. So when I went back to New York, I showed them the sketches to them and said, remember to color her hair blonde because it was Marilyn Monroe. I was emulating, but the colorist inadvertently gave her red hair. Oddly enough, a full cycle later, Vicki Vale is in the new Batman movie. She's Batman's love interest. We kept away from romance in the early Batman stories because Batman was primarily a kid's vehicle. And That's not even think, true. <laughs> it's not even true. None of this is true. No. He's like, he's like uh, you know, I told him to, to make her blonde, but they made her red. And yeah, so much of this. Doesn't, like, even in this issue, <laughs> Bruce Wayne makes a comment yes. about like, you know, I've been Batman so much. It's, it's nice to be Bruce Wayne every now and then to have time for romance. Yes. It, it, and it, it totally doesn't even make sense. So like in 1943, Jerry Robinson and Bill Finger move out of Bob Kane's apartment and into the bullpen. So they're actually working directly for DC at this time. And Bob Kane um, spins off and works on the newspaper strip. That becomes his like, you know, his baby. Right? He, mm-hmm. He's super interested in that. So at this point, he's like six years. I don't give a crap about the comics anymore. So the idea that he's like coming and giving them ideas about what they're going to do is just like patently untrue. So unfortunately we don't have a lot to know like what they were thinking uh, other than like what we can drive derive from like, well, you know, Lois Lane was also going on in the comics at the time. Also there was these other characters and like probably inspired by those because it's a very similar like archetype. She looks a bit like Torchy in my opinion, honestly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like- <laughs> Had you heard of have you have you seen those movies before or? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, not, I was so I, I was toying with a, a torchy a torchy video, but I would it, love it to may see happen that. one day. I don't have any idea who that person you just said. Is. <laughs> That's the Warner Brothers movie character, and they end up having like a bunch of um, torchy comics. So there's a I didn't know that either. Yeah, so <laughs> there you go. Well, I think there's just one more interesting yeah. Vicky thing, even though it doesn't take place in this issue. But one mm. of the things that ends up happening with her is that there are a lot of kind of little mistakes that happen when they bring her back. And my favorite is that when they first bring her back, they say that she's married. And then a few issues later, they forget. And they have, because they weren't talking with each other, so they have Bruce like pick her up and go on dates. And it was, it was one of the fan letters that writes in to Dick Gi- Giordano, and they have to fix it. And they write in, like, oh, she's divorced, just to like quickly. I love <laughs> I mean, that. Like, it's fine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he wasn't cheating with a married woman. <laughs> That's, That's so awesome. funny, especially like this, like, super ethical character for kids. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Yeah, well, this was funny. down, by the time this happened, this was way down the Bronze Age, so we were a mm. lot darker, well, darker in mm. quotes, but yes, I would, yeah, are darker. <laughs> uh, I've noticed that, by the way, about your videos, that you often reference, like, letters pages. I love that. The letters pages are my favorite part. <laughs> really? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I like, I love the issues, but I love seeing what people were saying about the issues. And I mm. love how so many of them you could just transplant, but with different language to today. Like, they're the exact mm. same concerns, the exact same complaints. And I absolutely love that. They're like, how dare you change this person's, like, outfit or hair color or other things? Like, <laughs> I hate it. Boo. <laughs> yeah. And they're, like, keeping track of continuity, like, better than the editors. Yes. Or writers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. 
so uh so i guess tell us what what is what is uh casually comics what's the elevator pitch uh well casually comics is my youtube channel where i basically talk about wherever my whims take me what i'm interested in at the moment in terms of various comic book minutia be it the history of characters certain plot lines adaptations and comparisons to the comic lines they're pulling from just pretty much anything that I'm interested in. I want it to feel like a fun fandom space where you can just kind of come and hang out and chit chat and hopefully be entertained and maybe hear something you cool. hadn't heard before. Super cool. Yeah, what what I love about your channel is that the topics are really wide ranging. Lots of different time periods um, yeah. covering comics themselves, movies, TV shows, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and you clearly have lots of knowledge and are well-researched. I appreciate that you're often citing your sources, you know, uh, which is something that we try to do is like, I love that. I'm sorry. But like talking about where you got the information, because then I can go back and like do no, my it's, own. No, it's know. so important because sometimes when I'm researching, yeah. that's that's half of what I'm doing because it's just like this happened in 1994. I'm like, when? When in 1994? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very broad statement. Totally. So yeah, wh wh what's your history with comics? How'd you get into it? And like, uh, yeah, because you, clearly you're, you've demonstrated quite a love. Where does that start? Um, so I have like some buried like childhood memories of comics, but I really got into it in university when I was waiting for the bus to take me to university and there was a bookstore there. Mm. And I was sometimes waiting for like over an hour for a ride. And I just feel like, you know what? I would walk past this section every day of all the big graphic novels because this was the era when everything was a graphic novel. There's like, do we have mm -hmm. it reprinted? And so mm -hmm. I just, I ended up picking, I still have the copy of it, Batman Hush up off the shelf. And I'm like, nice. I'm taking it. This is the one I'm going with. And I read it on the bus on the way to university and I really loved it. And it started to unlock memories of the few comics I had read that had been lying around. Like my dad, he had this, like some incredible Hulk. There was a specific Catwoman issue. I think it's Catwoman 13, if I'm recalling correctly, from the 90s Ballant run. And I read that to pieces. It literally fell apart. <laughs> and whichever issue it is, it's either 13 or 11, but I read it to pieces. And I just really got into it. And I got really fascinated in tracking the history of things because I was jumping in right in the middle to a lot of these plots and things were just hitting the ground running. Like one of the other ones I got early on was the much maligned and not very liked uh, identity crisis. But <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed Identity Crisis because I found it interesting because it was all of these different characters, some of whom I hadn't seen before, and it was very much a jumping on point of finding out the histories of all of these characters. And because you had the internet and the burgeoning like forum scene and all of those things, it was just a lot of fun to go and find it out. And I also like collecting things, as you can see behind me, so it appealed in that way too. <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, I think for us, like there's so many people in the space and this is not a knock on anyone, but like where they grew up with it. Right. Like there's so many mm -hmm. people talk about like, um, you know, this is when I stopped reading and this is what came back, you know, when I came back or like this channel brought me back or this movie brought me back or this run brought mm -hmm. me back. And, um, that's something that like, I don't have have right like i came to comics as an adult like they're, like yeah i had like sonic archie and like you know teenage ninja, ninja turtles and stuff so it's like not, not like i had never opened a comic book mm -hmm. before but like i wasn't a fan right like it wasn't the sort of thing where you know i had a comic shop or that i was you know reading it every you know week or um you know every month um going to the store and picking those things up it was as an adult, like I was in my twenties and I moved to a new town and there was a, a comic shop there downtown. And I was like trying to get to know the area. And I stopped in and I said, what should I get? You know? And they handed me, this was like 2016, you know, and they handed me, um, Tom King, uh, Batman. And they handed me, um, Jason Aaron Thor. And I, I just kind of like, it went, went from there. Like, you know, mm -hmm. picked up tra trade paperbacks and like I've fallen down the rabbit hole and like, you were talking about um, identity crisis. That was one that I, I read relatively early on as well. And I appreciated that as an event that like, like you said, was, was a bit of a jumping on point because there are others that are impenetrable. Like if you pick up um, the final crisis, right. Uh, without any other knowledge about like what was going on, you're completely lost. Like even with knowledge of what's going on, it <laughs> yeah. takes a minute. <laughs> I, I can't. Yeah. And, and so, so, so much of like being an adult, 
and like trying to figure it all out is like having resources, you know, where people can make it more approachable and make it fun and make it, you know, I, I think there's intentionally or otherwise some, some amount of gatekeeping in the community of, of like, you know, if you're not someone who has <laughs> been doing it forever, then like, it's not for you. And like, I love channels like yours and Sal, who we had on previously from comic pop for like giving people an on-ramp and like teaching them about, about the history and things. Um, so yeah, I, I love that about, about your channel. Well, um, thanks. I really appreciate that. Uh, so uh, another question that we always ask uh, anyone who guests on our show, uh, because the answers are all over the place. <laughs> Alex and I have both uh, answered this question, but is, uh, what is your earliest memory of Batman? Oh, earliest memory of Batman is uh, going to the video store and finding the VHS tapes of the collected Batman um, 90s episodes. And mm. there was one tape in particular. I've, I'm trying to remember what episode it was, but I remember it vividly because I was a little kid. And so when the credits rolled, I stopped the tape. And one day I didn't get to the VCR in time. And then I realized there was a second episode on the tape. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> oh my there are gosh, two episodes on so one funny. tape. That's but awesome. I rented those over and over again. So that was definitely my first encounter with Batman. <laughs> Yeah, Batman, that's the cool. animated series, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from 92. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. So, I mean, I guess, um, what got you started on doing YouTube? Oh, my, uh, my YouTube journey was, I've actually been on YouTube for an extremely long time. I've been on YouTube since I was in high school doing uh, fan edits, like music videos, AMVs, and all the stuff that people used to do back in the day. So I've always had a channel of some kind. But I got into doing this one specifically because I used to work for a, a YouTube like channel company, not like an official for YouTube, but like a company that did YouTube videos and those types cool. of things. And I, I ran um, post production. And so I wanted to start to do my own thing because we had a nerd channel and I also worked on it on occasion, but I really wanted to talk about the topics that I was interested in, which oftentimes are not the trending or topical topics. They're just really random at points. And I was just like, I want to talk about these things. And I don't care whether they're topical or not. Like sometimes they happen to coincide, but if they don't, that's fine too. <laughs> and so I had mm -hmm. had another channel before that that was about shipping and fandom culture in that capacity. But mm -hmm. I kept talking about comics on that channel. And so I was like, you know, I need to branch this out because it's happening anyway. Like everything I want to talk about just kept becoming more and more comic-y. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just let's just do this. And I still have that awkward first video where I'm standing and all kinds of things that never happen anymore. <laughs> Well, I think it's so awesome because like I, I, that that is I think part of your success is that you are doing things that other people aren't 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 doing, right? Like it may be the case that someone gets recommended your channel because like they searched for, you know, um a death in the family or something like that. And then like they're going to get your episode ab about, you know, uh, you know, Jason Todd. And and then they subscribe because it's awesome. It's like got a good edit, you've got a good perspective, right? And then you know, in their feed is a video about like the Batman Brave and the Bold cartoon which like not a lot of people even watched and is like several years in the past now and mm -hmm. they're like i know that sasha's gonna have a great take and now they're like kind of sucked into something that they may not have really kept track of before right and so they're you're you're bringing people to your corner of of the fandom of of the the comics history and stuff and i love that that's it's so cool well um, i hope that people find what i'm talking about interesting i hope they don't think i have a great take i hope they just want to come <laughs> and see whatever i'm i'm talking about but sure it's been it's been a good time and it's nice to just uh talk about whatever basically yeah, it's totally. just sometimes mm -hmm. there are things that i'm like i'm getting a bit too niche you know i'm sure. like, I need to calm it down and maybe <laughs> pull it back a little bit but you're introducing people to stuff is what yeah. I meant to say. Like you're, you're helping people learn about stuff and like find it too. I, th I think that's cool. It's, um, it's fun. Although one of the things I mentally tell myself, it's how, because I'm actually a, a really shy person. So one of the things mm. that I tell myself is like, nobody's watching. And that's how I'm able to like, <laughs> it's like, it's just me yeah, and the camera. <laughs> Yeah, that helps. Yeah. It yeah, helps totally. us that no one no, actually no one's watching. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, 
so I'm kind of curious, uh, since you've been doing your show for a while and, and you do so much uh, research for the episodes that you put up, do you, have you noticed that like you think about things differently than you did like a few years ago? Mm, like when you, you were doing when you pick up something for the first time, say like 10 years ago, you were like, ah, it doesn't matter. I'm listening, I'm watching it just for fun or I'm reading it <laughs> just for fun or whatever. Now, do you like have a different mind about it where you're like, ah, oh, I need to like put a note here. Or I need to a dog ear this corner to come back to it or, or there's a there's a part of my brain that catalogs it but it's just kind of in the back because i'm like lots of these things i'm probably not going to talk about or not have uh time to talk about one thing that does happen though is i start um i kind of start editing it like a little bit like in my mind which is a weird thing to do but especially if i notice some kind of like hiccup or paneling thing or continuity thing i just automatically start editing it in my head and i'm like i don't know why i do that but i just start doing it. i'm not even sure if it's because i have the channel thing or if i did it before but that's like when you say editing it you mean like you're editing the show, like you're saying, like this is how um, I would have done it, or are oh, well, you saying with, like with um with video editing, 100 sure, percent. Sure, that's sure. just because I am an e an editor. So mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, totally. in my in my professional life, like I am an editor, so I just automatically start doing that. But in the comic book sense, I do that. I do that too. Like I'm working on a video right now, uh, mm. time of filming of uh, Power Girl, and that that awful pregnancy arc that happened. And I just keep like pausing and being like, we could have moved this over here. And like, that could have gone over there. And like, this yeah. wouldn't have been as awkward if it happened over here. I can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. That's super good. Um, who, are, who are some of your favorite superheroes, whether or not it's Batman? <laughs> well, Batman is definitely a character who I enjoy a lot. My mm. favorite superheroes are often cycling. So I have a roster and the interests, they kind of flow and cycle through. But some ones I always come back to, like runs I'll return to. I'll return to Booster Gold. He had that post-52 pickup run that I always come back to, which I really enjoy. Hal Jordan grew on me in ways I did not expect. And so I return to like certain eras of Hal a lot. The Sandman, like mystery theater, dart, it's, it's intense, but I return to that from the 90s. He's another person I enjoy. And then just outside of the DC Marvel like area, I go to Astro City a lot. I love the heroes of Astro City. I just think they're so cool. <laughs> So I, I have a, a different Batman question. It's co completely off the rails, yeah. different question. Um, and I've never asked anyone this. Alex and I have talked about it a little bit. Mm. But um, uh, since, you, since you're super knowledgeable and you like pick up all the stuff, um, who do you think portrayed Batman the most accurately in film? Well, it depends. Which era of Batman are we pulling from? Because depending upon what Batman, if we're going for accuracy to accuracy i would say mm -hmm. that would have to be adam west from the silver age because those two are actually like feeding off of each other at the time so yeah. if we're going off of the idea that they're close together i would go with that but i have a very interesting criteria for what i think makes a good batman portrayal mm, i think you have to nail bruce wayne mm-hmm I think if you haven't nailed Bruce Wayne, I feel like anybody can just be in the costume and be Batman, but you need to be able to capture the essence of Bruce Wayne. Yes, and I, I don't agree. feel a lot of adaptations have done that personally. It's, it's interesting because that was kind of one of the things that Tim Burton had said was that like he wanted to focus on Bruce Wayne more. Bruce Wayne, right? yeah. mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't know if Michael Keaton did that or not. I, your perspective on, on that, but um you know, I, 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 I think it's interesting that it's, it is something that, like, not not for lack of trying. Like, it, 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 filmmakers definitely have tried to give us a lot of time of Bruce Wayne outside the suit. Well, it depends on what you view Bruce Wayne as, though. Because totally. some of mm -hmm. them view Bruce Wayne as just a mask, not a person. And right. that's just not a take I subscribe to based mm. on all of the history that's there. So if that's the base that's it's coming at it from, I tend <laughs> not to really vibe with that portrayal as much as mm -hmm. one where it's more acknowledged that Bruce is still a person. Like, And that's mm. why I think my favorite Batman movie is um, Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Because... Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's just such a, a, a human heartbreaking movie. Those yes. scenes where he goes to like his parents' grave and begs yes. to like, what if he could just have a normal life and be happy? Yes. Or like when he proposes to her and all of the bats come out of the ground, just heralding his future. And it's just sad. <laughs> Do you have any hot takes about Batman? <laughs> what What's considered a hot take <laughs> these days? <laughs> Uh, something that you think would be contentious, or maybe people wouldn't dis- uh, agree yeah, with you. A controversial take. Mm-hmm. Um, I I assume this is controversial. It's not controversial to me, but I don't think Batman having money is a bad thing, or makes him unrelatable, or that it means he mm. can't relate to people. Mm. I think that Batman has, or Bruce has, relationship to people because of the tragedy that he suffered that bonds him to Gotham and especially the underclass of Gotham in a way that it wouldn't have otherwise. And in fact, you see that there's a disconnect between Bruce and other people of his own class because of that. And that's portrayed a lot over time. But I feel like for some some takes, that's not the case. And it might be controversial. I've seen people get into arguments about it in my comments, so maybe it's controversial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting, right? Like I think I think one of the the sort of things that makes people uncomfortable about the character is the idea that like potentially, you know, I- if you were going to step back from the fantastical element, you know, more could be done as Bruce Wayne than could be done as Batman. Like you could yes. y- use his money for for good, right? But the thing is mm-hmm. that that doesn't make a super interesting comic well, like my thing is that he does on yeah. the regular like he has his foundations he's regularly totally. you know mm-hmm. going into the city and doing those things mm-hmm, there was that mm-hmm. arc where um he gave his money to dick recently and then mm-hmm. dick gave it all away and i was like but then you can't control where it goes like that was me i was just like but then, <laughs> but then what are they gonna do with it <laughs> like you don't know where sure, it went sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah no i was that, like that super concerned <laughs> i was like but but now you can't do anything else <laughs> it's gone <laughs> <laughs> so, so my brother and I, we do like these voice memos back and forth. And like, mm-hmm. just like yesterday or the day before, he was telling me that he's been catching up on the podcast and he's been rewatching Batman 89 and was kind of asking for my take on it. And he was like talking about the pacing and things that were kind of weird. And he was like, it's really weird that there's this like rich guy who dresses up as like a bat. Right. And I'm like, yeah, that's one <laughs> of the like big, really interesting elements. Like if, if like Elon Musk super rich dude like dressed up in a bat and started fighting crime people would be like wow his ketamine is like working you know like <laughs> it, you know and they'd be like why why aren't you like using your money to like change policies and, and stuff like that and and it part of the whole like batman uh experience in my opinion is like keeping in mind that like originally it was for kids and it's like supposed sure. to be kind of uh, escapism. I feel like there's also a bit of an aspirational element to it, too. The idea that, like, you know what? What if you had this money and you you still did good? And I know that there's an argument, but, like, he goes up and, like, he beats people up. I'm like, that's the, the fantasy, like, the fantastical element of, like, he goes out and he, he stops the crime. But the other thing, too, that you see over time is that he also gives people opportunities to reform. He'll seek out the people who he beats up and, like, offer them jobs or things like that to try and improve their situation and Mm -hmm. they highlight that a lot in like the um the 70s also the 90s animated series actually does too and so there are lots of different angles to take batman from and then of course you have the other arcs where it's like he's on venom and like he's on the streets so it's just (laughs) yeah (laughs) well there's a take for everyone right like there's there's different angles for sure um that, that people can take and i think you know to your point like we do see time and again, like demonstrations of him using his wealth or um, being in touch with people who are, you know, destitute or whatever and, and, and having that sort of connection. Um, But like, I think for some people, the disconnect feels like it's the amount of time spent. Like, you know, you read 12 issues of, you know, Scott Snyder's, (laughs) uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Court of Owls or whatever. And we spend like the first few pages of the first issue talking about the new Gotham that he's going to build. Right. And it's like, well, Turns out, like, you can't make a 12-issue series about, like, the 501c3 that he's working on. Like, it's just, like, not a super interesting thing of, like, you know, here's this mega project. Like, where is the rail going to go? Like, how are we going to pay for it? What is the zoning? You know? Like, oh, it's just not a... You've jogged my mind. That's a hot take I have. <laughs> no, yeah. 
Let's hear I, it. Um, I love and hate the Court of Owls at the same time. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> that is a take. Yeah. Did you, do you want to elaborate at all? Sure. Or? I love, okay. I love the design of the Court of Owls. The art in that arc is amazing. The hallucinations, mm-hmm. the masks, Talon. I enjoy all those things. I never enjoy takes where they make they make the death of his parents less random and oh, they sure, make sure, it sure. this giant yeah. conspiratorial yeah. type thing. Yeah. Because I'm, for me, part of what works is that it was just this tragic thing that, that could happen to anybody. Like, it's just, yeah. you could have been walking down that alley and, you know, it's... So for me, it takes a bit away from that. And then it's one of those things that because it was cool, because I'm not going to lie, it was cool. They keep coming back to it. They're like, yeah. we need to like make it bigger, bigger, more. And I'm like, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's not often that what what I think works so well about it is that it's like adding to the lore of Gotham itself, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're adding this cool new wrinkle. Um, and, and that the idea that there was something sort of lurking in the background the whole time is like this new knowledge that we've unlocked that like, what is what are the secrets that have been hidden? What is the, you know, the sort of like CD uh, or not CD, the, the sort of like secret society that's like pulling the strings is a really cool idea. But yeah, to your point, and like, isn't, I'm, I'm totally butchering it because it's been years since I've read it, but isn't there a point where like, they've cloned Nightwing or something like that to be one of the Talons or like, they're like creating connections to because well, Nightwing, it's like Nightwing well. was like supposed to be a Talon and there's like a yeah. whole thing. <laughs> the, 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 the retcons of like characters and their relationships is a little weird. Like the retcon <laughs> of the city is cooler to me. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show, Sasha. It was it was such a pleasure having you here um, and you brought such a great uh, perspective on all of this. So thank you. No, thanks so much. I was really excited when I, I got the message. I love talking about a classic Batman. It's a lot of fun. Hey, Bat family. Help us out and drop a like on the video and tell us what we got wrong in the comments. If you want your voicemail or letter on the show, you can send it to us on our website, batlessons.com. And to keep the Batman history train going, watch this video next. 